This presentation of the 2014 Detroit Autorama is brought to you by Pilot Transport, the auto hauling specialist. We get it, and we get it there. And by Eaton Detroit Spring, made in the USA in Detroit. For many of the show's participants, the pinnacle of this Detroit Autorama weekend is the presentation of the coveted Riddler Award. The Riddler is the most prestigious and sought-after hot rod building trophy. Winning it is the automotive equivalent of winning the Oscar for Best Picture. In order to compete for this award, this must be the first public showing of the car. Eligible cars are meticulously judged for their creativity, engineering and workmanship, and then ultimately narrowed down to eight finalists. Each of these eight owners received the highly respected Great Eight Award. Let's take a closer look at these incredible vehicles. This is Dan Duffy. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and this is my 1956 210 Post car. First time ever out here at the Detroit Autorama show in March of 14. The driving force behind this car was my brother who had one, and I got to drive it, even unlicensed, because if I kept it clean, I could drive it. The car was found down in Moultrie, Georgia at a swap meet in uh, November of 2010. Probably the easiest way to describe what we've done to this car is to tell you that we sectioned it from the back to the front, beginning zero the back at the chrome lines, to the front where there's a total of three inches of metal has been taken out of the car. Watching the looks on the people's faces that they come by and take a look at it, they, they, the guys that know cars realize something's been done. To have made the grade eight this year is absolutely incredible when you consider it's the first time I've ever attended the show. The last three weeks have been, um, I think we call it thrashing, and it's been a heck of a lot of fun. I'd do it all over again. We fortunately had most of it completed, but all the final details were, were finished in the, within the last 10 days. To, so to be here, is a, it's a euphoria feeling to have gotten into the grade eight, certainly. What we've done here is try to build the car with form and function, kind of like a 50s style hot rod. Hello, I'm Jeff Kinsey. I'm the, the shop owner of Hot Rods by JSK. And we built a 1932 Ford four-door sedan for uh, Don Smith out of Mansfield, Texas to compete for the Riddler. The sprint car steering, uh, a lot of the, the solid axle, the tall skinny tires, you know, wire wheels, all the door handles and, and stuff, you know, not shaved on the car, kind of a traditional car. We do a lot of the designing on the car, uh, a lot of sleepless nights, laying in bed, thinking of ideas and what to do the next day and, you know, stuff like that. That's where most of the design comes from. We set two goals, one to get here, one to make the grade eight, and, and we've done that. When Bill Mitchell first designed the car, the idea was to bring to North America a North American designed car that had the flavor of a Rolls Royce and the performance of a Ferrari. My name is J.F. Lanier. I'm from British Columbia, Canada. I built and own this 64 Buick Riviera that's behind me. The car's a concept custom, uh, could also be considered an exotic. I've built a car that's going to haul ass like a Ferrari, but it looks luxurious. To do that, I took a car 
that had a really strange roof line and decided, okay, what am I going to do to fix that so the car is proportionally correct, so that it looks good, and so it has a bit of flow, because the roof on a stock car really doesn't flow. When I incorporated Bill Mitchell's 1971 design into the car and actually put the boat tail roof, later Riviera roof on an earlier Riviera, the things started to take shape and it started to meld into a car and the custom car that you see here. You can see that the fenders, the wheel well arch has been moved three inches forward. You can see that the hand-built louvers in the back of the fender resemble Corvette, but they're bigger. They're sort of more in your face. They're bold. The quarter panels are completely hand-built. I widened the car five and a half inches in the rear to get it to have that bulky sort of sports car look. Hand-built the trunk, hand-built the back section of the car, but the lines are all still GM. So if you're going to build a modern day interpretation of a car, you kind of have to stay with the times. You need fuel injection. Twin turbos are really, really common. We're talking about them even for fuel economy in the EcoBoost systems. You know, like they're, they're just commonplace nowadays. You're going to get 20 miles to the gallon. You're going to get 850 horsepower. Where to put the turbos was the big thing. We elected to sort of put the turbo system in the back of the car, allowing us to sort of put the intercooler system in the back. Turbo tubes then feed all the way back through the car above the passenger's head, which is going to make a lot of racket. You hear it, it's super wicked. All the high-end exotics give you a taste for the driving experience, and they let you know that there's, there's really some muscle behind the car. So there's, this is no different than that. I'm going to drive the frickin' wheels off this car. The idea was to build a car that would do 200 miles an hour and compete at this level in a car show. If it's scratched and got a bunch of rubber up the back quarter panels, it don't bother me. I like to make a statement with my cars, so it's always bold colors that I choose. This is a big, bright yellow. BASF did the paint for us. It's a one-off mix that we did that'll probably be available to the public next year. But it is the thing that makes the car. I grew up in a family that was quite poor, and I had to build my first car rather than buy it. My parents weren't going to buy it. I was 13 years old. I bought an old farm truck and restored it. By the time I was 16, I was using it. And I still have that truck to this day. I take my kids to their first day of school every year in that truck. The Riddler thing is really, it's an emotional thing. I've been crying for a couple days, just the fact that we got here. The journey to get here was based on sponsors giving me product. My efforts every single day for the past three years, not taking a day off other than Christmas. And a group of almost retired friends and, and, and a big group of people that stood behind me and would show up evenings to help me, they would show up weekends to help me without being paid just to be part of something a little bit bigger. It's, a, it's not a journey of man versus man, it's a journey of the people versus the people that are bigger than us. It's, 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 this is a people's car built by people. I wanted to be here. I want to win this award because I believe it'll change how people look at me as a builder.
my journey is completely different than anybody else's. I'm the owner, I'm the builder, and I'm too young to have amassed any sort of wealth to be able to do this. This, this journey that I, I took on was a personal one. I wanted to be here. I want to win this award because I believe it'll change how people look at me as a builder. And having that chance will allow me to be the best artist that I can be. We did it! From the outsider's point of view, I knew I'd built a great car. Was it enough to impress the judges to win this award? I didn't know that for sure. The ideas, a lot of them morph as I, as I build the car. My dad and I were talking, he's like, how did you engineer the chassis to have everything fit in and be so good? And I'm like, no, you know, I didn't engineer the chassis. It has to fall into place. First, I built a body that had a nice shape. It had no chassis in it. Once I got an acceptable shape and one that I enjoyed, I was able to build a chassis to support that. Because I had built the roof so low, I ended up having to build a perimeter frame so that the seat and the seat bum sits really low so your head has clearance. So a lot of that stuff's just dictated by the overall design of the car, which is always my priority. I don't compromise design. First I make the design, then I fit the pieces to the car. The Detroit Autorama has spoken. It's spoken to the industry. It's spoken to every kid, boy or girl out there, that has a hobby, that wants to be the best at something. It's not a checkbook that got me here. You know, I, I got here because I wanted to be here more than anything else in my life. I've sacrificed for 10 years. My family's had to sacrifice with me. We'll buy a $10,000 set of wheels, but we struggle to find grocery money. It's not David and Goliath. That's, that's something that, you know, I am, a, you know, I am David and, and I was against Goliath in, in essence, but it was really a story about the people. It's a group of us people that were able to do something that's that much bigger. We ran the car into the garage door the day, five minutes before leaving. So we put the car in the trailer with no grill, no marker lights, the whole front end smashed up, put it in a trailer, stopped at some friend's place in, in Chicago and repainted the nose of the car four days ago. It's like, I, I, it's like there's something wanting to stop me from finishing this car. There would be issues. It just became a game of problem solving. That's determination. And that's knowing that you need to do this above and beyond all things that matter. I told one of my friends, I said, if my mother dies in the next six weeks, we'll have to wait till Tuesday to have the funeral. She'd understand.